Good afternoon or evening. Um, thank you for joining us today for our book talk about wartime North Africa. Uh, my name is Gabriel Sanders, and I'm the public programs producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibitions, Boris Lurie, Nothing to Do But to Try, running through November 6th, and survivors, faces of life after the Holocaust from famed photographer Martin Scholler, uh, which will be opening on September 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. We appreciate the vital support of our members at the museum. If you want to get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat in addition uh, to the links I've mentioned. If you have questions for our speaker during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Though I will be off camera during the talk, I'll be here in the chat for any thoughts, questions, or needs. Today we are honored to be joined by Sarah Abravayastein. Sarah Abravayastein is Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Director of the Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies and Viterbi Family Chair in Mediterranean Jewish Studies at UCLA. She is the author and editor of 10 books, including, most recently, Wartime North Africa, A Documentary History, 1934 to 1950, and Family Papers, A Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century. You can buy Wartime in North, North Africa, A Documentary History, 1934 to 1950, at bookshop.org, which again is linked in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and now I will hand it over to Sarah. Wonderful, thank you Gabriel so much. And my thanks to Sydney for the invitation and the entire museum for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen in order to um, have you view a series of visuals to accompany my talk. And I will try to keep an eye on the chat function. Oops, pardon me. But mostly we'll be turning to your questions and comments um, at the end of my presentation. So I am speaking to you today about a topic that has been largely marginalized from the history of the Holocaust on the one hand, of the Second World War, um, also excised by and large from the history of North African studies. Um, but I have been involved with my colleague Omar Boom, professor of anthropology and history and Jewish studies at UCLA in trying to rectify this problem. We have published um, two books thus far. Uh, the first one, The Holocaust in North Africa, uh, was edited by the two of us. And the one that Gabrielle mentioned, which is just out, is Wartime North Africa, uh, just released this summer. And that is really going to be the focus of my presentation today. And we are very pleased to be um, breaking into a relatively new area of study which has had contributions in French um, and in Arabic, but very little uh, in the scholarly realm until very recently in English for English language readers. I want to begin spending just a couple of moments um, speaking about um, the landscape of um, North Africa before the war began, as it may be new to some of viewers watching today. Um, the North Africa, the countries that made up North Africa, and I will show some maps shortly, um, had about half a million 
Jewish inhabitants in the years leading up to the Second World War. This was an incredibly uh, diverse population. Um, it was a population that had uh, urban pockets and rural pockets, coastal communities, Saharan communities, um, communities that hailed from different historic cultural communities that hewed to different religious rites, who spoke different languages. Um, North African Jewry was incredibly variegated, not only by which country or colonial um, territory Jews resided in, but also variegated by the many conditions that shaped Jewish life across the countries that made up this region of the Maghreb. And I'll be speaking today about uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya, although um, Libya will receive slightly less of my attention for the purposes of this presentation, although it is covered in um, the books I've written with Omar. So when we begin our story about experiences of the war in North Africa, uh, during the Second World War, I think it is so important to begin with this question of internal Jewish diversity, because the diversity that marked North African Jewry in the years and decades leading up to the Second World War also had an impact on their experiences of the Second World War and Holocaust era. There were rural communities, that were quite far removed from the centers of authority in North Africa, who wrote about being scarcely touched by the events of the war and even by the anti-Semitic and racist laws put in place by the fascist regimes. But there were areas that were absolutely and utterly transformed and Jewish communities that were absolutely and utterly transformed by this history of Second World War fascist rule. Now, we must also begin by clarifying that the region of North Africa was occupied by three different fascist regimes in the course of the Second World War. France occupied great swaths of North Africa, especially in uh, North and West Africa as well, uh, under the leadership of the Vichy regime, a term I'll get to in a moment. Germany and the SS occupied Tunisia for a period of nine months. Tunisia was also occupied at various points by um, the Vichy regime, British allied forces, um, uh, as was Libya. Libya, on the other hand, was under the governance of the Italian fascist government under the leadership of Benito Mussolini. Now, I, the pictures I am showing you right now indicate the commencement of occupation in North Africa. Various scenes that show us a, if one looks closely, a diversity of street scenes here where we see ordinary civilians and um, European military representatives stationed on the ground. And here I offer you a map, which hopefully you'll be able to get your hands on the book Wartime North Africa and scrutinize in a bit more detail. But this map shows us the, the variation of occupation in place in North Africa, a zone of Spanish controlled Morocco to the north, um, French West Africa and, and the bulk of um, Morocco under French control, Algeria under French control, Tunisia, mostly French with German occupation, and Libya with the different uh, array of, of occupiers that I spoke of a moment ago. Now, when the war reaches North Africa, when occupation reaches North Africa, the demography of the region has already been transformed by the rise of fascism. In particular, we must remember this is a region, as I said a moment ago, with half a million approximately Jews stretched across uh, all of North Africa, vast more numbers of Muslim and Amazigh uh, women, men, and children. But in the early years, in the 1930s and um, edging into the 1940s until it was no longer possible, but mostly in the 1930s, there is also a population of refugees, refugees, Jewish and non-Jewish from Europe, 
like uh, Esti and Sophie Freud pictured here, who fled Europe watching the rise of Nazism with fear for their communities, for the continent, and for their families. This story of the European refugees who fought, who sought um, uh, protection in North Africa, though they couldn't escape it for long, is also represented in a series of memoirs, including this by George Hunter, um, and this is a different kind of story by Camillo Adler, because there were other refugees in North Africa as well at the start of the war, and even before the war actually technically comes to North African soil. We have Jews and non-Jews who fled the rise and spread of Nazism. We have not only Europeans, but international uh, volunteers who went to Spain in the course of the Spanish Civil War to fight against General Franco and in defense of the Republic of Spain. When Spain falls to General Franco in 1939, many of these volunteers will find their way from Spain southward to France, and they will be in France when France is occupied, the north of France is occupied by Germany. And under various circumstances, many of these erstwhile volunteers for the Spanish Civil War will be deported to camps in North Africa, and I'll get to that momentarily, mostly by the French regime, and we'll be talking about their experiences. Um, it isn't only these displaced parties who are in North Africa watching the rise of fascism, of course. There are local Muslims and local Jews, including uh, this man, Sidney Triki, who watched the unfolding of the occupation of his home city, Casablanca, the implementation of race laws. And he presents in the memoir pictured here, his story of the war. And even perhaps most unique about this book is the story of what happened to him as a young boy when the allies um, uh, execute Operation Torch and uh, claim North African territory from the Axis powers. And again, I will slowly return to these topics if they are new to you as I proceed. Now, all of these people that I have been speaking about, local Muslims, local Jews, European refugees, uh, erstwhile volunteers for the Spanish Civil War, I didn't mention another population of displaced parties who find themselves in North Africa, and that is um, Europeans, mostly but not exclusively Jews, who volunteered for the French Foreign Legion to fight against the encroachment of Nazism, and like the volunteers for the Spanish Civil War, would find themselves enemies of a new uh, Nazi-allied regime in France when it was created. But before we get to the creation of that Nazi allied regime in France, and before we get to the implementation of race laws in France, and the erection of camps across the region, I want to dwell for a moment on the reaction of ordinary North Africans like those pictured here to the rise of Nazism. For what I and my collaborator have found is that from the very moment that fascism begins to take shape and rear its head in Europe, uh, everyday people in North Africa are paying heed. And they are not simply paying heed, but they understand what historians only now have come to appreciate. And that is to say, they understand that their fate as residents of North Africa will be profoundly changed by the rise of fascism in Europe. One of the early oracles of this is Isaac Knafo, pictured here, who penned an extraordinary poem in 1939 uh, in pamphlet form under the title Les Hitleris. Now, Isaac Knafo was born in Essaouira, uh, Mogador, Morocco. He studied in Paris. He returned to his hometown, then under colonial rule. He was the son of a rabbi in Eswira, and he was um, a playwright and an author. And very early, 
he, as, a, as an observer to the rise of Nazism in Europe, even before there is war declared on European soil, he pens the extraordinary pamphlet pictured here, which is a kind of fantastical, phantasmagorical, vivid, at times incredibly um, uh, uh, purple in its language, poem warning of the rise of Hitler. And I would like to read now a selection from his book that we have translated in wartime North Africa. I will just read two um, short stanzas to the reader. I have seen hatred flourish in the country of the Nazis and a whole nation endure the caustic, corrosive acid thrown at them like a cruel joke by the speeches of an insane, vulgar buffoon, this pernicious clown seized by fury, preaching denunciation, murder and violence. Despite my indifference, I feel my face flush and turn bright red from shame and disgust in my feeble hands, the whip of satire is too clumsy to excoriate Hitler. At least it expresses my complete aversion. And that is why, reader, though I may displease you, in order to release my sorrow and to cry out my anger, I offer you this text filled with indignation. Now, writing in 1939, Isaac Knafo did an extraordinary thing. Not only penned this pamphlet of inflamed writing against Hitler, but printed approximately 2,500 copies and dispersed them through his hometown of Essaouira. And then he uh, watched the occupation of Morocco um, by the Vichy French regime, and he panicked. He realized the document made him vulnerable to arrest and uh, worse and deportation. And he single-handedly gathered every copy of this pamphlet and burned them. And fortunately, one copy remained in the hands of uh, a family friend, one single copy, which was passed down and published um, recently in full and as well in our selection. Now, I begin by reading Isaac Knafo's words because I want to emphasize that North Africans, whether they were Jews or Muslim, whether they were local residents or refugees who found themselves in the region during the war, they were keen observers of events in Europe. They were not passive victims of the regime. They were not simply um, there to have race laws and violence and starvation and imprisonment put upon them. They were witnesses, they were oracles, they were resistors, they were angry, they were expressive, and they wrote. And they took photographs and they drew and they produced myriad documents that historians can work with and that teachers can use in the classroom. One, and these are the kinds of documents that we have gathered and translated in the book, Wartime North Africa. Among these documents are not only critiques of Nazism by Jews. Hamid al-Maliji also wrote a, a, a very potent critique of Nazism in, in Arabic. We also have an organization known as the Committee of Semitic Union that takes shape in Algeria. And you can see in this depiction, it is a partnership of Jewish and Muslim residents of Algeria who bond together out of their shared fear of the rise of fascism and their determination to work together to stem its tide. This is um, a, a pamphlet by the International League Against Racism and Antisemitism formed by Bernard Lacoche in France with outposts across North Africa. Similarly, working with Muslims and Jews to create a coalition opposed to fascism that published documents that engaged in activism and that became such a important and singular voice against fascism in North Africa and as well as in France, but in North Africa, that when the Vichy, um, when France is invaded by the Nazis, they, the French office of this um, organization becomes target by the Nazi um, occupiers who view it as a site of threat and a site to be ransacked, closed, um, and, um, and its contents pillaged and destroyed. Now, um, 
let's actually return to this picture. Now, I want to lay a little more historical groundwork for what happens next. Um, Nazi forces march into Paris and occupy Northern France. June 1940, uh, the First World War, war hero Philip Pétain on behalf of occupied France signs an armistice with the occupying uh, German forces. And according to the terms of that armistice, armistice sets up a regime, mostly in Southern France with its headquarters in the city of Vichy. And that regime is known as the Vichy regime. And from this date of June 22nd, 1940, onward through the war until Operation Torch in North Africa, um, the Vichy regime will implement all of the anti-Semitic legislation that is implemented in France, will implement that same legislation in its colonial holdings in North and West Africa. That is race laws, laws of spoliation, um, laws of segregation, uh, and policies aiming to separate Jews and also non-Jews at views as a threat to the regime from the broader public. Um, the first race laws are implemented by um, the French regime uh, in Vichy, both in continental France and in North Africa in June of 1941. And uh, sometime later, the regime begins to create a, a range of camps across its territories in North Africa and West Africa. Similarly, and I'll show you a map in a moment, there are camps being created in Italian occupied Libya. And shortly there will be camps created in German occupied Tunisia. But let's dwell here for a moment. There are here a range of camps. There are labor camps, um, often on the sites of industrial labor, such as mines and rail building. There are um, uh, camps for temporary internment. There are camps to, um, to hold so-called criminal elements. There are camps for prisoners of war. And look how many such camps now become scattered across French North Africa, across Morocco and Algeria. And you will notice that to the South, there is a particular concentration. Um, I will try to speak about the range of these camps as I continue, um, and I will explain the concentration in the South. Here we see a map of Tunisia. Many of its camps um, actually were um, camps where prisoners were held while they engaged on forced labor on municipal projects, especially in the north. And you also see some of the camps erected in fascist controlled Libya. Now, Italy was the first European power to introduce race laws under the realm of fascist leadership in North Africa. Historically, racist legislation had been in place in North Africa since the early 19th century when European colonialism began to unfold there. This legislation deprived Muslims and Jews over uh, legal rights, uh, deprived them of legal rights. It um, created vast destruction to the land. It destroyed cultural institutions. Um, it produced all measure of um, challenges for the people, the cultures and the land and landscape of North Africa. I do not want to give the impression that with the rise of fascism, it is the first time that racist legislation is imposed on North Africa by Europeans. This has, alas, a very old tradition. But beginning with fascist Libya, fascist Italian controlled Libya, we see the implementation of race laws um, in North Africa for the first time. And I'm gonna read you one more voice briefly because it is so important to highlight individual experiences. And this is an essay written by an adolescent young woman by the name of Marie Abravanel, a resident of Tripoli um, in Libya, 
who was a teenage student at a school of the Alliance Israelite Universelle um, when um, the fascist Italian regime began to, to um, implement its um, anti-Semitic and racist legislation in Libya. And she was asked to write an essay on what it meant to be Jewish. And I want to read you just a paragraph, March 6th, 1939, being Jewish. In the past, I rarely thought about the fact that I am Jewish. Reminders would come to me in the course of our holiday festivities, and I considered myself a being just like all others, blessed with the common capacities of man, sensitive to the pains and joys that are part of life, with the only difference being the religion of my ancestors. I must have fooled myself. To this day, belonging to this faith is a problem. Recent events have refuted my former convictions and have aroused in me sorrows that only a Jew is called upon to feel. I am Jewish. Consequently, in the eyes of some, I am marked by the stamp of shame, unworthy of fulfilling any function in society or of nourishing any lofty uh, aspirations. Now, in each of the places of North Africa that we are touching upon here, and of each one could be investigated individually in richness and detail. Because we only have an hour together, I am trying to weave their stories together, which inevitably means we won't do justice to any one context. But I am going to try to touch upon all and the differences and similarities of all. Now there is more to say about the camps, but one cannot begin to mention fascist World War II era camps without first speaking about the death camps of Europe. There was never a policy by um, the fascist regime to systematically deport Jews from North Africa. Some Jews and some Muslims do get deported to the camps of North Africa through convoluted and complex circumstances. Additionally, there are Italian, there are Jews in Libya under Italian control who are put in camps first in Libya and then sent to camps in Italy. And some are deported from there to Auschwitz and other camps uh, in Europe. Some additionally, there is a population of Jews of North African origin living in mostly in France, for example, in the cities of Marseille and Paris, who might have been there as temporary residents like Victor Perez, world flyweight champion, or who might have been immigrants or who might have been the children of immigrants who were born in France. With the rise of the Vichy regime, these distinctions were unimportant. All of these individuals, temporary residents of France, from North Africa, um, immigrants to North Africa who might before the war, excuse me, to France from North Africa who before the war might have acquired French citizenship or the French born children of North African Jewish immigrants who by law would have been French, all would be vulnerable of being stripped of any legal status they had and of being deported alongside other Jews in France to internment concentration um, and death camps, including this um, famous individual, Victor Perez, who is accordingly sent to and annihilated in Auschwitz. These stories represent a minority story of North African Jews, but they are a crucial part of the European history of fascism and of Nazism. And it is would be irresponsible for us to uh, erase or fail to mention their story in the context of this presentation. Returning to the landscape of North Africa, we saw a moment ago the map showing the array of camps created across North Africa, including in the Sahara. These camps uh, are of a variety of forms. Um, some hold, uh, some hold people who are viewed as suspicious or enemies of the regime by the French Vichy regime. This could include former volunteers for the Spanish Civil War. This could include former volunteers for the French Legion. This could include refugees, whether Jewish or Christian from Europe, the kind of um, aimless 
terrified, drifting individuals famously captured in the Hollywood classic Casablanca. But what Casablanca does not show is that many of these people would be arrested and deported to camps like this in Jelfa. Um, here is a photograph of Bulgarian volunteers for the Spanish Civil War who found themselves deported by the Vichy regime to camps, a, a number of camps uh, in the region. And here we see um, another individual, Max Aub, whose words are incredible, which we reproduce in wartime North Africa, who as well was uh, a, a volunteer in, in Europe in the fight against fascism, comes to North Africa as a prisoner and like many is moved around from camp to camp. Uh, here we see him pictured in Jelfa where he wrote a diary on scraps of paper that he was able to reconstruct after the war. These camps, as I said, were of um, mixed nature. Um, the most hazardous were in the south of Morocco and Algeria, controlled by the Vichy regime, situated on industrial sites, uh, and their prisoners were forced to engage in arduous um, labor, slave labor. Um, some of these camps were sites of a project that was inherited by the Vichy regime from the French colonial regime. Its ambition had been to create a railroad that would cross the Sahara and that would allow for the transport of bodies and precious goods and weaponry um, from South and, and, uh, and from Saharan Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa um, through the Sahara to the Mediterranean coast and, and from there to Europe. This had long been a dream of the French colonial regime. It is reanimated by the Vichy regime and many of the Vichy camps in North Africa are on, uh, not many, but a portion are on sites of this um, rail line. Um, prisoners in the forced labor camps uh, controlled by uh, Vichy France in North Africa are subject to backbreaking labor. They are exposed to extreme heat and extreme cold. They are exposed to a population of, of threatening species, everything from um, you know, scorpions uh, and, and beyond. They have inadequate food, they have inadequate clothing and shoes. And many of their calls for help, which we are able to document um, through the archives of philanthropies as well as through their own writings, are calls for not only liberation, but for the simplest of um, forms of aid, a new pair of shoes, a, a way to treat um, a rotted tooth, um, support for an amputated leg, a food for children. I mentioned uh, philanthropies and I do wish to mention one of the most important um, a philanthropist working in North Africa at this time, Moroccan Jewish lawyer, Helen Benatar, the subject of a new wonderful book published um, just recently by my friend and colleague, Susan Miller, that I recommend um, you pursue. She worked in collaboration with the American Friends Service Committee to support internees throughout the North African Vichy controlled camps. And uh, Omar Boom, my collaborator and I were able to pour over the documents of uh, the American Friends Service Committee, the Quaker organization that had a base in North Africa that received pleas for help for all measure of individuals imprisoned in um, the camps of North Africa. Um, I return here to the map um, quickly because I want to now guide us from the Vichy controlled camps back to um, other locations, um, and especially moving from the Saharan camps to the coastal camps first of Tunisia. Um, in Tunisia, again, which is directly occupied by Nazi forces for nine months during the war, winter of 1942 to spring of 1943, and otherwise is under French and a variety of uh, other forms of control, here the camps um, focus upon forced labor on municipal projects including but not limited 
to the city of Tunis. Um, and we may read extraordinary stories of local Jewish men who are inducted into forced labor uh, and who are housed in these camps alongside an array of other prisoners. And here we see a group going to forced labor in the city of uh, Tunis and its outskirts. And the book Wartime North of Africa represents their stories of day-to-day -day struggle, as well as the struggle of ordinary individuals, women, men, children, experiencing Nazi occupation um, in Tunisia and fearing um, all measure of, of consequence from those horrific nine months. Um, now, I mentioned earlier the Italian camps, which follow a rather different um, trajectory. Um, the territories of Libya fall under different hands in the course of the war. It's quite a dizzying wartime trajectory. Um, at a certain point, the Italian fascist regime reconquers a portion of Libyan land from British hands. And it ostensibly begins to worry that the Jews in these areas, this is its public declaration, will um, betray Libya and Italy to the British occupiers. Um, this is not the only reason that they would create camps, but this is a reason that they publicly offered. And now um, we find that uh, the expulsion of vast numbers of Libyan Jews, entire families, children, women, men uh, of all ages, of all classes to camps across um, Libya. And I'll return quickly to the map so you can see where some of these are located. Bukbuk is actually um, just over the border there to the east in, in Egypt, which is pictured here. Some of these um, prisoners will um, be sent from the camps in North Africa to camps in Italy and from there to um, German overseen death and concentration camps, including this population of survivors who are returning home from um, the German concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. Um, now, we are swiftly moving through the years of war, and I have just five more minutes before I want to turn to conversation, and I can see that I have a number of questions that I am saving for that period. Before I talk about the turn of the tide of war, which is Operation Torch, and here we see allied representatives um, in the wake of the successful unfolding of Operation Torch in um, North Africa, I want to draw attention to something that has not yet been mentioned, which is that it is not just local Jews and local Muslims and European refugees who are falling prey to racist legislation and imprisonment and spoliation and violence at the hands of the occupying fascist regimes. Since the colonial era, France forcibly conscripted uh, black soldiers from West Africa. Sometimes these soldiers are called Senegalese, but they were not only Senegalese. Sometimes they are called the Tirayos, but they have different names. And throughout the Second World War, it continues its policy of forcible constriction of black men from West Africa and also from Morocco. And in the camps, um, one finds the extraordinary encounter between representatives of the French flag who are forcible conscripts, who are little more than prisoners themselves, coming into close proximity with prisoners of this incredible array of other backgrounds. And I find it incredibly significant and moving to have this context of North Africa remind us of how a European fascist and before that colonial campaign of anti-Blackness and racism merges during the Second War with a war against Jews. Now, I began to mention Operation Torch. This allows the Allies to seize territory in North Africa and from North Africa to continue further military successes eastward 
and ultimately to embark upon um, a passageway through Sicily to continental Europe. And it is, this landing is as important as D-Day in the turning of the war. Now, um, pardon me, now rather shockingly in the wake of the allied um, occupation of North Africa, the laws of the Vichy regime are not immediately lifted. Uh, racist and anti-Semitic legislation remains in place. Those who had property taken from them do not have it restored. Most perhaps disturbingly, the camps um, that were run by the Vichy regime continue to be run now by the Free French government, sometimes with the same Vichy era administrators in place. And so we find even after Operation Torch that the trauma of fascism and occupation during the Second World War continues for um, the imprisoned and for many um, individuals across the region. Now, as I move to a conclusion, I want to just mention very briefly that our book, Wartime North Africa, also attempts to pursue this story after the war and to think about legacies of war and memories of war and trauma of war. And this is represented in a wide range of sources and voices, including the haunting story of a young man who is uh, returns to his native city of Tlemcen, Algeria from Auschwitz, where a number was of course tattooed on his arm. And he speaks of returning to his home city traumatized with what we now understand to be post-traumatic stress and a tattoo that none have the ability to understand. Um, Simone Lagrange is another case. She was a child of, um, she was herself born in Morocco, but um, emigrated to France as a child and was there with her parents um, and siblings when the uh, Vichy regime arose. She is a resistor. She is um, uh, arrested. She is held in the Drancy internment camp. She is held in Auschwitz and astonishingly becomes a key witness in the trial of Klaus Barbie in 1987. So when we think about legacies, we must think not only about legacies of trauma and of pain and of forgetting and of the inability to understand, but also we must think about histories of the reclaiming of of truths and of voice. Finally, I want to return with the point with which I began, that this remains a forgotten history for most students of the Holocaust, for most students of North Africa, for most, most residents of North Africa. And today, the crumbling remains of the um, forced labor camps run by the Vichy regime, but run also in Italy, uh, in Tunisia are exist in a state of decay with no memorialization, with no demarcation, with no vehicle for memory. Despite what I would call an intentional forgetting, the voices of North Africans have loomed powerful and large and lasting. And it has been a great honor to work with Omar Boom to bring together these voices in all of their diversity, to translate them, to do, to offer them, I think, a, message, a measure of justice by honoring their history and the extraordinary stories they represent. With that, I will um, welcome Gabriel back on the call and on the Zoom, and we will um, perhaps see if there are questions that um, await answers or your comments. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we do have a few questions that have come through and I'll start with those. If you have a question, please post it in the chat and we will get to as many as we can. Um, the first question that came through um, was a comment that I'd like to turn into a question. Um, the person said, very few books are written on Jews of Libya. And you talked about this generally about um, you know, a subject matter that hasn't been explored. Do you have an idea of why that is? Um, you know, why has there not been enough research in this area? 
It's such an important question. Um, and it is actually rather a complicated one. I think it has to do with a variety of factors. Um, when it comes to the field of Jewish history, and I'm a professor of Jewish history at UCLA and a scholar of Jewish history, I don't think it will surprise those present to hear that this field is overwhelmingly dominated by the study of European Jewry. Um, and not only that, but um, archives around the world that are dedicated to a reconstruction of uh, or a, um, a um, preservation of Jewish cultures also overwhelmingly focus on European Jewry. Now numbers play a role. There were vastly more Ashkenazi Jews in the modern period than Mizrahi, Mediterranean, Maghrebi, Sephardi Jews. So demography does play a role, but it doesn't offer all of the answers. If, if demography explained all historical choices, we would certainly find a lot more books written about women and children than we do. Um, I would say additionally, when we specifically talk about Libya, that while it has been possible for scholars of North Africa to access a wealth of resources in Morocco, for example, and even in um, Algeria, as well as Tunisia, it is far more difficult to acquire the uh, original materials held in Libya due to sustained um, unsteadiness and um, uh, difficulties of access. So I would say we have a problem that keeps reproducing itself. We have a problem of a subject that is not being taught a subject that is erased from syllabi, from textbooks, um, and we have a subject that is difficult to research further. Um, there are wonderful scholars who are seeking to, and have worked through careers, seeking to overturn this trend, and I, it is my hope that we begin to right this wrong. Thank you. All right, we have a few more here. Um, I don't know if you have this answer about specific statistics. Someone was wondering on the number of North African Jews who died during the fascist occupations. Uh, thank you. I see Bert, that you asked that question. I don't actually have that number at my fingertips. And we could break down that number in different ways, of course, because there is the question of quantifying those Jews of North African origin who find their way um, through the horrors of the Nazi death camps. There is also the question of the vast number of Jews in North Africa who fall prey to elements of the regime's, the regime's plural violence, um, who may or may not perish because of the regime's activities, people who lost property, who were squeezed out of the professions, um, who were driven from homes, um, who had their family structures broken apart, who were subject to forced labor and so on. So um, we do a little bit more quantifying in both the book Wartime North Africa and the Holocaust in North Africa. I don't have the numbers at hand. I, I would also mention that Omar Boom and I have been able to contribute some new encyclopedia entries to the online encyclopedia of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on this topic. We've written, I think, five, which do a very nice job of concisely reviewing the history that I presented here. Um... How did um, soldiers and prisoners from each side cross the Mediterranean between Europe and North Africa um, without interference from the opposing side? Yeah, I mean, this is this is an extraordinary story. Um, those who were forcibly moved from continental Europe to North Africa as prisoners, for example, because they had volunteered in the Spanish Civil War or volunteered for the French Foreign Legion, those groups especially, they are moved quite violently um, by train, by boat, um, by cattle car. Their story is told in a number of memoirs that we represent in wartime North Africa. The story of those who make the reverse movement from North Africa to Europe, whether they move as migrants before the war, or whether they are forcibly moved during the war, for example, Italian Jews, um, or unique cases of people sent to the death camps. They also um, didn't, well, they did not always have the opportunity to write their story, but we have been able to document their story 
through, through select memoirs and diaries and documentation. Alas, as we all know for Holocaust history, few voices must stand for many because of the many lost, um, as well as documents that we have been able to find about these people through um, delving into archives around the world. Um, on the question of how soldiers were moved, soldiers were often moved very openly. This was not, um, and this was, the, North Africa is a site of ongoing military combat. So soldiers were not moved peaceably or anonymously. They were often moved in the course of violent warfare. And I will say, returning to the subject of the black soldiers forcibly inscripted by the Vichy regime, that these soldiers were often given the hardest, most dangerous frontline positions. And they perished in numbers far exceeding um, other demographic groups in the French army, which is sort of a, you know, a tragedy within a tragedy. And um, they, after the war, were not allowed to, to sort of publicly celebrate their achievements alongside um, white and European uh, soldiers for the French um, government whether Vichy or free French regime. Thank you. All right, we have a few questions here that are about some specifics. So uh, we'll see how many we can get to. And um, I know some of these questions are answered in the book and in other research sure. too. So I know, um, you know that Sarah has pointed us in that direction. Um, this one, I think, touches on the first question too a bit. Um, and some people have mentioned um, their fathers as being yes. part of, you know, uh, these battles or American soldiers. Yes. Uh, one person's father was an American soldier in World War II, landing first in Oran, mm -hmm. Algeria, going to synagogue and attending a family, family seders um, in Algiers. He didn't seem to be aware of any of what you're yeah. discussing today. So we talked about yes. this church not being widely known, but even to people who were there, um, and th this person has an Algerian sitter he took off with. Um, how do you think it would have been possible for him to not have seen or experienced what was going on? Um, what, if any knowledge, did U.S. troops have of what had been going on um, where they landed um, and spent so much time? So how could, for the people who- Yes, it's such a good question. I mean, let us think about what we know of um, allied troops breaking into the um, Eastern Front, what used to be the Eastern Front in the course of the war, breaking into Eastern Europe in the course of allied advances in the war. As they discovered the death camps, uh, as the Soviets discovered the death camps, as allied soldiers discovered in greater numbers of concentration camps in Germany, they were not prepared for what they found. They did not have the context to understand the devastation, the human wreckage, the trauma, the needs, the reasons. This is well known. And the same is true in North Africa. People did not have the context. These soldiers were not um, prepared. Um, they uh, were often shocked with what they encountered. They often had very partial experiences. So depending on where they were, in what battle, in what city, in what community, um, they, might, um, they might have a completely different experience than a fellow uh, soldier stationed somewhere else within the region. So it would not surprise me that a soldier with boots on the ground, so to speak, would not understand this history, would not be exposed to this history. I mean, after all, it is still only now something that we are able to access broadly in English for the, for the first time. Of course, we have to remember this was before the gathering of testimony. This was before the publishing of memoirs. This was before memorialization. All of this was unfolding in a chaotic fashion. Um, so, the story that the person spoke about the father having very positive interactions, I have heard echoed in other accounts, accounts by soldiers and accounts by locals. I showed you earlier a, a picture of Sidney Treaky, um, who was a young boy when he witnessed Operation Torch outside his window. He comes to work for the American uh, military um, as a representative of, uh, of the region and as a translator. And um, 
he writes about how much he learned about American culture from these troops because there were so many kinds of interaction. There were military interactions going on. There were commercial interactions going on. Woefully, there was sexual violence that occurred during um, military occupation, whether it was French, German, or alas, allied. Um, so this, we have a lot of perspectives on the massive arrival and influx of, of soldiers. Um, and we can begin to understand their experiences, but in terms of their naivete, that I think would not surprise us given what we know about the chaos of, um, of the war of, of competing occupation. Thank you, Sarah. So um, I think we'll have time for probably two more questions and I, we appreciate you putting, you asking them um, and your interest. Someone wanted to know here about um, when you spoke of the Vichy, Vichy yeah. entity, mm -hmm. it seems that you were suggesting that they maybe operated as an independent entity. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. This person wants to know, is it not more accurate to understand this as a puppet state of Nazi? Right, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So um, I would argue that when we speak about the Vichy regime as a puppet regime, we make the mistake of stripping away from France and from the French people, the agency that they exerted in implementing racist and anti-Semitic laws and in imposing uh, fascist rule in their colonial um, outposts. I think that phrase is problematic. This is an armistice negotiated by French leadership. We have to remember that in, in, in continental France, when there are Jews deported, especially the foreign born, it is the French police operating in collaboration with SS occupiers who are overseeing and implementing that deportation. So I think in many ways um, that not only my own research and Omar Boom's research touches on, but that is um, undertaken by scholars of France, that that term diminishes the, the magnitude of French action in being their own agents in the course of war, especially in the Vichy zone. Okay, thank you. I think we have time just for one last question. Um, and I'm sorry that we can't get to everyone today, um, but really appreciate you tuning in. Um, I think this might be a nice one to, to close out on. Can you speak a little bit about life for Jews after the Allies landed and the camps were liberated? Um, they believe most people emigrated to Israel. Um, why do you think people didn't stay in North Africa and how was life for them? Thank you. Um, so today there is um, a very, very, very small community left of Jews in North Africa. And it is true that mostly these communities have scattered across the globe. It's actually not true that most um, go to Israel. They, depending on where they are from, they go to a variety of places, to France, to Canada, to the United States, to various places in Latin America, as well as to Israel. Um, they, the Moroccan Jewish diaspora is very widespread and, um, and diverse and thriving. And um, that is a topic of its own. These communities begin to emigrate at different times for different reasons. They, they do not um, emigrate en masse after the war ends and these camps are disbanded in North Africa. Um, some stay on for, um, for shorter times than others, but their history of departure I think to really understand it, we have to get into the nitty gritty story of what is happening country by country uh, and region by region. It would be wrong to try to paint um, a regional history in a single swath. But what I think is so important is that there are communities, especially in Tunisia and Morocco that maintain an incredibly active relationship with their, um, their erstwhile homes, carrying on business there, um, philanthropy, um, visiting um, social or familial ties, um, working with local communities to memorialize the past, to gather documentation, and much more.